Hello everyone and welcome back to more Saya no Uta. In the last video, one of Fuminori's friends trespassed in his house and we can only assume that she was attacked by what Saya really is. And then we found her eating some suspicious fruit which Fuminori can eat. So that's all uh, rather disturbing if you ask me. Nothing. <sighs> This is the third day that they haven't been able to get in touch with Omi. There's no sign of her having returned to her apartment, and even her family doesn't know anything. Her parents have already filed a missing persons report. Well, you know her. She'll probably just pop up somewhere like nothing happened. Yeah, I hope so. Yo replies with a gloomy expression. She's worried about Omi, of course, but the incident with Fuminori three days ago must still be weighing on her mind as well. Yo hasn't seen Fuminori since then, and Fuminori hasn't made any effort to approach them. Four people used to meet in this cafeteria between classes, but now there are only two. Hey, Tonokun, let's keep thinking. Isn't there somewhere Omi chan might have gone? Yeah. No. Koji answers evasively. I checked them all already. It's a lie, of course. Koji knows where Omi planned to go that evening, but he doesn't want to bring Fuminori up in front of Yo. Their awkward silence is mercifully broken by the bell signalling the start of the next period. Well, I've got to go. Yeah, they've both lost a person that they care about. It's so, so sad. If Koji isn't mistaken, Yo is supposed to have class next period too, but she continues to sit there like she's in a trance. Unable to come up with anything to say, he reluctantly leaves the cafeteria. Both Omi's disappearance and Yo's depression worry Koji, and both problems lead back to the exact same place. Fuminori what the hell is Fuminori doing? When Omi went missing, the first thing Koji did was question Fuminori. The last time he'd seen Omi was just before she'd stormed off to give Fuminori a piece of her mind, after all. Fuminori had responded with blunt, unequivocal denial, and had acted as though he hadn't the slightest idea why Omi would have gone to his house. Perhaps that was only natural, as he was unaware that Omi and Koji had witnessed him reduce Yo to tears. In the first place, did Omi actually make it to Fuminori's house? She'd been riding a wave of emotions when she'd left, and might very well have calmed down and changed her mind halfway there, but then where would she have gone after that? Or perhaps she ran into trouble on the way? Koji concluded, or more accurately convinced himself, that one of these possibilities was the truth, subconsciously denying the one remaining possibility. In other words, the possibility that Fuminori was lying, that he had met Omi and was involved with her disappearance. When questioned by the police, Koji only told the truth about Omi's destination up to the district and train station, maintaining that he had no idea where she planned to go after that. It's nice that he's still trying to save Fuminori, despite the fact that Fuminori's just been a complete knob to everyone involved. He wanted to cooperate with the search, of course, but knew that Omi couldn't have made it to Fuminori's house. Fuminori said so himself, didn't he? In that case, he told the police everything they needed to know. Not wanting to get the still fragile Fuminori involved, he forced himself to accept this flimsy logic. But now the conflict has built up inside Koji without his notice, and only formless suspicion towards Fuminori cycles through his mind. Koji is deep in thought, paying no attention to his surroundings, but perhaps that is what allows him to catch sight of his friends back through the crowd of milling students. Oh, his friends back, sorry. Fuminori? Fuminori? At first, Koji assumes that he's headed to the lecture hall, but it soon appears that he is instead going home. Strange, there should be required classes for medical students in the afternoon. Though he is initially surprised, Koji's hesitation lasts for only a second. 
Koji follows his friend, taking care to stay far enough behind that he won't be noticed. Oh my gosh, all of his friends are going to get themselves killed. Stay away from Fuminori's house. Fuminori wasn't going home, as became obvious when he boarded a train heading in the opposite direction. Koji's next guess was that he was going to see his doctor at the Tea University Hospital. But Fuminori rode straight through the closest station. Where's he going? At first, Koji felt awfully foolish, rebuking himself for turning his friend like this. But his conscience fell silent as Fuminori's actions became more mysterious. The stranger it gets, the closer Koji feels to discovering the truth behind Fuminori's sudden transformation. Any knowledge would be welcome, no matter how slight. Even Koji is beginning to think that there must be something more behind Fuminori's change than the accident alone. He wants a more satisfying answer, one that will help him decide whether or not Fuminori can be trusted. Fuminori gets off at a small station in a nondescript suburban area. Koji follows, trying not to lose sight of him amidst the other disembarking passengers. The station has neither a traffic circle nor a shopping street in front of it. The area is quite desolate, possessing only a small bookstore, convenience store and market. It is easier for Koji to help to keep Fuminori in view. Fuminori seems to know these streets, clearly intent on a single goal as he hurries through the residential neighbourhood. Carved out of the hills, the area has many slopes, and here and there remain steep inclines and wooded areas that escape assimilation. Koji, who moved to Tokyo to attend school, is amazed that such a quiet place exists, less than an hour out of the city. Before long, Fuminori reaches a house. Without ringing the bell or even knocking on the door, he vanishes inside as though sucked into a vacuum, leaving Koji to wonder how Fuminori can treat the house as his own. Maybe he owns a second property! Why are you so sceptical of this? After waiting to see if Fuminori will come back out, Koji approaches the gate and checks the nameplate. Ogai. Koji has never heard of anyone by that name among Fuminori's acquaintances. So what if he makes other friends? Next, his attention is drawn to the thick wad of leaflets sticking out of the mail slot, which, coupled with the general dilapidated feel of the place, suggests that it has been long since abandoned. A small playground is about two blocks away provides an adequate vantage point from which to watch the front of Ogai's home. Fortunately, it does not appear to be the sort of house that has a rear exit. Chiding himself for not stocking up on cigarettes, Koji settles down on a bench to begin his stakeout. One hour passes, and then another, but there remains no sign of movement around the Ogai residence as twilight settles upon the neighbourhood. For all you know, he's squatting in there, he might not leave till the morning. After Koji's one pack of cigarettes runs out, the stakeout becomes a battle against mounting impatience. He kills time by redialing Omi on his cell and sending her short text messages, but his efforts are as futile as he knew they would be. When the sky begins to turn deep blue and the streetlights come on, Fuminori finally emerges from the house and heads back towards the station with the same hurried stride. After some brief consideration, Koji decides that right now, investigating the house is more important than tailing Fuminori. He probably thinks she's in there. He rings the doorbell just to make sure. Receiving the expected silence in response, he checks to make sure no one is watching and turns the doorknob. The door is not locked. The moment he enters the house, thick, stale air fills Koji's nostrils. Redolent of mould and dust, it is the unmistakable smell of a house that has long lain untouched. There is also a faint hint of something indescribable in the air, something reminiscent of damp sewers and fetid cisterns. Flipping the light switch does nothing. The power must be dead, or perhaps cut off. Koji uses his oil lighter to illuminate the immediate area. In the thick dust covering the floor, he can clearly see several brand new trails of footprints that could only have been made by shoes. They must be Fuminori's. Showing an equal lack of reservation, Koji also enters with his shoes on. Kids these days are so gosh darn rude. The lighter's flickering flame pushes back the deathly silence and gloom of the house. 
Koji is surprised to see evidence of life remaining. Everything from furniture to tableware and appliances is intact. Nothing seems to be missing. The thickness of the dust suggests that the house has been empty for several months, which means that the owner must have left with little more than the clothes on his back. Could he have gone on a long vacation? The calendar in the den is still turned to April. Empty and silent, yet still exhibiting signs of the life that once lived here, the house reminds Koji of a passenger ship resting at the bottom of the sea. In the graveyard like quiet, a sinister thought suddenly runs through his head. No one is living here. That doesn't necessarily mean that the owner left. Maybe he was killed, and his rotting corpse is right under my feet. He does not trust Fumnori at all. Koji finds himself wanting a stronger light. A mag light in his hand would make him feel a lot better. Following what appears to be Fuminori's footprints, Koji ascends to the second floor, where he begins to catch the scent of paper in the stale air. It is the smell of old books, instantly familiar to anyone who has worked in an antique bookstore or library. The second floor turns out to be a study, its towering shelves packed with such a vast number of books that Koji fears for the stability of the floor. As a medical student himself, he is able to discern at a glance at the that this study belongs to a medical professional, and a high-level one at that. Judging by the content of the books, a smorgasbord of technical volumes far beyond a simple student, the owner must be more interested in research than clinical medicine. It appears that Fuminori spent most of his time here, the scattered dust making it clear that he was searching for something. He seems to have focused on going through the desk and file cabinet, as the contents of their drawers are in obvious disarray. A small pile of books on a side table catches his eye. Being next to the desk, they must have been the most frequently read. What sort of books they are could sh uh, what sort of books they are could shed some light on the person who worked here. Koji frowns as he examines the three books. The old leather-bound Western tomes are not scientific texts, but rather the kind of books you would expect to see in a glass case at a rare bookstore. The titles are equally mysterious. Trait de Chiffre appears to be about semi semiotics, but Ars Magna el et Ultima is some kind of treatise on divination. And then there's the Voynich Manuscript, which appears to be a sort of picture book. When he pages through it, however, he finds line after line of utterly incomprehensible characters. Maybe it's some kind of cipher. Whatever they are, they clearly have nothing to do with medicine, refuting Koji's earlier guess that Mr. Ogai was a doctor. Looking down, Koji suddenly notices the glint of something black and metallic under the chair. A pocket-sized maglite. Quite out of place among all these dusty books. Fuminori must have brought it in. With slight relief, Koji exchanges his lighter for the maglite. His tiny body emits a powerful white beam that casts away the darkness. His courage restored, he decides to explore the rest of the house. Hmm? Koji notices something strange, something that was not visible in the lighter's weak flame. The slime. Especially thick on the doorknobs and stair banisters. There are no me these are no mere handprints. Dark, slimy stains are everywhere, like someone had their hands wrapped in greasy cloth. Looking closer, he sees what appears to be the places where slime was splashed low on the walls and near the floor. It's almost as if a wet mop was run violently across the floor. I have to wonder about Ogai. Does he have the same condition that Fuminori has, or did he put up with this kind of weird monster, is what I can only imagine. Are these more remnants of Ogai's life? No, these marks are much too strange. Koji begins to feel sick as he finds himself imagining the denizen of this place, wandering around with filthy water dripping from its entire body. Finding the bedroom next to the study, Koji checks the, clo the closet on a hunch. He finds two empty suitcases, not what one would leave behind when going on a long vacation. So that suggests that maybe Ogai didn't kind of leave, maybe he was kidnapped or something. A sudden chill runs through him, so whoever was living here is still somewhere inside the house. Or that could be a possibility. Suppressing the urge to flee, Koji goes back downstairs to check the first floor. If he finds a corpse, he'll have to call the police right away. He can get away with trespassing if he reports it first, 
But if they find the body later, it will be awfully hard to explain his fingerprints all over the house. The maglite reveals the den to be covered in even more slime than the rest of the house. The sofa looks as though it was dredged from the bottom of a swamp. In the kitchen, Koji takes one look at the sink and decides not to get any closer. He doesn't want any more fuel for his imagination. He reaches the door to the bathroom. A common scene from TV dramas flashes through his head. A suicide with slit wrists floating in a bathtub filled with water. And wasn't there a movie where a hitman butchers his victim's body in a bathroom? Koji stills himself and opens the door slowly, shining his light into the ceramic bathtub that appears from the darkness like a white ghost. Dried flesh and blood clinging to curved rib bones has turned the inside of the tub black. Koji puts one hand against the wall to steady himself as his legs threaten to buckle. Something is wrong, he realises, as he desperately tries to get his thoughts in order. Bones! But they're too small, and there are too many of them. They aren't human. The cat bones! After taking several deep breaths to calm himself, Koji enters the bathroom and examines the tub. The tub is half filled with small bones piled on top of each other like fallen leaves. Too small to be human, they appear to be from small animals like dogs, cats, mice and sparrows. Even so, the quantity is mind-boggling. How many corpses would it take to produce this many bones? The bones have all been separated from each other, and it doesn't appear that the bodies were just thrown into the tub and left to rot. This is made clear by the many groove-like impressions left in each bone, marks left by teeth biting through flesh. Koji's sanity won't let him consider the possibility that a human could have done this. The owner of this house must have been keeping some sort of carnivorous animal as a pet, giving it the bones of small animals to eat and disposing of the remains in the bathtub. But why not dispose of the leftovers properly? They could have just been thrown out with the garbage, or was there something keeping him from leaving the house? The momentary relief Koji felt when he realised that the bones weren't human is once again under attack by the ever-deepening mystery permeating this house. And just what the hell was Fuminori doing here? Uh oh, this could be a bad. What are you doing, Koji? <coughs> Koji whirls around, his pen light revealing Fuminori's expressionless face. <coughs> You're trespassing, Koji. <coughs> so, are you? Koji replies, barely managing to speak over the pounding of his heart. Fuminori pushes past Koji and looks nonchalantly into the bathtub, as though there's nothing strange about a tub filled with bones. <coughs> I know the owner of this house. I was just asked to find something. You know them? Since when? Who are they? Koji doesn't want to believe that the old friendly Fuminori could have had, have had contact with the denizens of this house. I'll introduce you one of these days, he says, turning to leave without even looking at Koji. I owe them my life, after all. Oi, Fuminori! Hey, Fuminori! With his heart finally beating normally again, Koji runs after Fuminori. Wait, are they the reason you've gotten so strange all of the- Standing in the entrance, Fuminori glares coldly at Koji over his shoulder. The utter lack of emotion in his eyes gives Koji pause. You followed me, didn't you, Koji? <sighs> With no possible excuse, Koji can only swallow under Fuminori's piercing gaze. That's a nuisance. I'll ask you not to do it again. <sighs> Fine. Fuminori walks away without another word, leaving Koji alone in the entrance. Until this moment, there was still a, still a part of Koji that wanted to consider Sakizaka Fuminori a close friend. Now, however, there is only ice-cold terror. Does the Fuminori he knew no longer exist? Was the person who just stared Koji down an imposter wearing Fuminori's skin? Crazier things have happened! Koji has begun to believe that it might be so. 
Well guys, that seems like a really good place to end the video. So if you guys have enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more. And until next time guys, goodbye.